Well, thank you, Angus. Uh, yeah, it's really my great pleasure to be here, and what fantastic talks uh, we've had so far today. It's kind of hard to follow the last one. Everyone's tired and uh, wants to go home. So I, I thought for my talk I would try and be as uh, enormously positive uh, as I could. And let me move on there. I want to talk about biotechnology, and I want to show you that we are living in a golden age where everything is really, really good. It's fantastic. And I want to teach you, a crusty academic, I want to teach you something about, uh, I want to teach you something about biotechnology so you appreciate how important it is for your life. And we talk about future proofing. The reason we're in this amazing position is because we're standing on the back of 50, 100, 100 now, 150 years of outstanding scientific research, which has now come to fruition and put our society in this amazing position. Okay. So when I started thinking about this uh, talk, I guess I, I thought about, you know, everyone always says, uh, you know, we don't make anything anymore. We need to make stuff. You know, we used to be a great manufacturing economy. Let's start making stuff again. We make loads of stuff. We make brilliant stuff. We make stuff like planes and things that go into space and, you know, energy and marine construction. And we do all these amazing things. And they're high-tech industries, I guess you could call them that. We make a lot of stuff, and we do it really, really well. The stuff I've highlighted there, I guess, is where biotechnology actually is really important and really underpinning. I've got construction up there. I put that one in a bit cheekily, uh, simply because we have research going on at the University of Bath uh, with colleagues of mine who are working on self-healing concrete. So there you are. It's, it's all going on. But really, I think the interesting thing about biotechnology is that it's so powerful, it's so sustainable, it's kind of easy to do. It makes us really adaptable to the future, and it's kind of future-proofing us right now. I, I guess, you know, like I say, I oh, can't resist the opportunity to teach something. And, and, and when I talk about biotechnology, I guess those of us of a certain age will think maybe of genetic modification of crops and of plants. And that's been going on for a very long time now. And it's been really successful for breeding in uh, drought tolerance or uh, higher yields. So actually, we can start to feed the world. It's a really important endeavor, and it's really safe. And, and sometimes it's really, really good, the appropriate caveat. When I talk about biotechnology, I want to think about making stuff. Okay? And when we make things in the biotechnology world, we actually look to biology, how we can do that. And we look to cells to make things. So cells are really good at making things. They're really good at making chemistry, okay? things like drugs. We use them all the time to make things like drugs. They're really good at making proteins. And Angus alluded to this. Proteins make up pretty much all of your body, and they do all of the jobs. And they can be like little molecular machines that do stuff for you. So cells are a bit like a factory. If you want to make something in a factory, you've got our normal factory on the left. You have a control center. And that's kind of like the DNA in your cells that controls everything. You have a production line. There's machinery in the cell that produces the chemicals and the proteins that we want to use. And then you have uh, all your waste management and cells do that. And they're very efficient at recycling what's in them. So it's a really sustainable kind of technology, biotechnology. I guess I, I think it's important to get a sense of scale. Angus, can you swing into action and click that for me? It's important to get a sense of scale for me to impress you. I want to impress you. I want to tell you everything's great. I want to impress you. So if we think about the scale of what we've got, we've got things up here like coffee beans and grains of rice and even sesame seeds. And if the technology works, which it looks like it is, fantastic, amazing, it's terrible. Uh, so we can zoom in very, very slowly. We won't worry. Ah, there we go. Look at us zooming in. And if we zoom in, we can see what the scale of things we're talking about. So we've got grains of salt. Right in the middle of there, we kind of got cells. So cells are kind of small, maybe really big ones, sort of the size of a grain of salt. Human eggs are huge. They're really, really big. OK, if you zoom in even more, skin cells, red blood cells, they're kind of normalish sizes. Remember, this is much smaller than a grain of salt now. Even more, we've got things like yeasts and bacteria. Yeast and bacteria are the workhorses, the cells we use to make the chemistry and the proteins that we actually care about. If we zoom in even more, just to get a sense of scale, we've got viruses. Viruses are really small, which makes them so nasty and hard to deal with. And now if we get to this point, we've got the stuff really that's inside cells, proteins and small molecules, bits of chemistry. How small is that? Well, if we zoom in even more from that, we can see right in the middle the scale of atoms. So right in the center of that dot, that is a carbon atom. That's the smallest thing you can get. Yeah? And that's kind of how big proteins are. That's kind of how big the scale we're talking about. Really micro, but really powerful technology. OK, let's move on. What is biotechnology? Let me impress you. Let me tell you how great it is. This uh, washing powder, 
You have proteins called enzymes in your washing powder, which are little molecular machines. There's one of my machines moving there. It's one of my students that made that. And they chomp away at all the food, and they break down all of the fats and the food and the blood and whatever else you've got in your clothes. And they do a great job at cleaning your clothes. We make things we got here, penicillin. Uh, here we go, it's got penicillin, that's kind of important, like that. That's made by biotechnology, that's uh, old technology now, but uh, antibacterials. We're all pretty much here because of them. Here we've got antibodies, we're going to come back to antibodies, they're kind of protein that cells make, they're really important. What about beer? Everyone likes beer. Alcohol, we've been making alcohol by biotechnology for thousands of years, brewer's yeast. So for thousands of years, alcohol, fine, you can put it in beer. What about in fuel? It's an amazing fuel. 10% of your fuel now has to be made by ethanol, okay? And that's made by yeast or biotechnology. It's really sustainable, it's really, really good. It's not all about things we can make, it's about sensing these molecules as well. Glucose, if you're diabetic, you have to monitor your glucose very, very carefully. And we've got biotechnologies, we've got technologies for monitoring blood glucose level. All of these things, I think you'll agree with me, are kind of amazing, and we kind of take them for granted, but they've put us, they're biotechnologies that are built on a long history of future-proofing to give us kind of an amazing society, an amazing, healthy, productive society. I want to talk about now antibodies. Antibodies are amazingly, amazingly amazing. They're really new. We've got antibodies in our body, and they protect your body from infection. We're now using them as drugs. They're really good at finding specific cells in your body. So what you can do is put a drug molecule, attach it to your antibody, and it will find just the right cells to deliver the drug to. And they're called therapeutic antibodies. And they're some of the biggest, no, they are the biggest drugs in the whole world. And they're relatively new, and they're so important, and they're so amazing, and they're such good drugs, that by 2020, we did a bit of work, I have to say in conjunction with uh, the RUH in Bath, they helped us a lot. We've worked out that by 2020, the NHS will be spending 2% of its total budget on antibodies for therapeutic purposes. That's a lot of money. That's how amazing they are. Even more money in America, even more money in China. So developed economies are going crazy on these things because they're keeping us all alive. They're curing us from cancer and sorting out our arthritis. They're really kind of wonder drugs in many respects. I guess antibodies, and the challenge with them is that, okay, take paracetamol or aspirin. It's in your bedside table, and it's there for years. Gosh, I dug one out the other day that's from, I don't know how long. And it will just solve the problem. It will work the way it was meant to work years down the line. Antibodies are proteins, and they're kind of floppy. And floppy proteins are really unstable. What that means is they tend to uh, break down and degrade. But when antibodies break down and degrade, they aggregate and they clump together. And in proteins, that's kind of, you're familiar with that. When you have an egg, it's translucent, and when you cook it, it goes all opaque. And that's the proteins in the egg, because it's really protein-rich, aggregating together. Now, with antibodies, actually, if they start to aggregate even a little bit, they become really toxic. So these amazing drugs, which are really, really good, become toxic if they are mishandled. This is not a problem. You don't need to worry. In developed countries, we've got the factory over here. We've got the truck that's got a fridge in it. Just keep it cold, it'll be fine. And the truck with the fridge in goes to the hospital, and they've got a fridge too, and that works really well. And it goes into the fridge, and then it goes up to the patient, and it gets administered. And we know exactly when it's get, gonna get from here, and it's gonna get up to the patient. So it's completely safe, completely safe. And they're fantastic drugs. We're lucky. What a time to live in. I really promise you these are great drugs. What about if you've no idea how long it will take you to get from here and to the patient. What about if you don't have a fridge or your power is so intermittent that the fridge only sometimes works? How can you guarantee that when you administer that drug, it won't kill the person? Therapeutic antibodies, which are wonder drugs, are hardly used outside of the, developing world, of the developed world. Hardly used at all. And there are a bunch of reasons for that. One of those reasons is because they are so relatively unstable compared to paracetamol and aspirin. You cannot guarantee that the drug that you hoped to deliver on day X will get there on day X or that it will have been cold all the time. And so you can't administer it because you don't know if it'll be safe. We have great partners in Kenya, uh, Peter Carrera and Francis Makoka from Mount Kenya University, and we're trying to think about this problem with them. So here's Kenya, and Kenya's got an interesting problem because there's Nairobi in the middle and it's got a bunch of hospitals. 
all the people kind of don't live there. They live all over the country. And some people live more than 1,000 kilometers from a hospital. So that's the kind of scale of problem they're facing. So they can't just nip to the hospital to get their treatment. Really, you have to have local treatment. But that's a problem for antibodies because they're just going to degrade in the back of the truck. We did some work with Maria Vitara. She's in the School of Management. And she thought, well, what if we just put hospitals in more locations? Can we solve the problem of getting people to a hospital? And unfortunately, the logistics in Kenya mean that just doesn't seem to quite work. So we do have to take the drugs to the people. But how are we going to get them there and make sure that they're safe? I think what I was excited about today and thinking about this problem is we could share some of our really recent work with you and I hope show you, and the idea is to inspire you to think that we can solve these problems if we think creatively. Maybe the background, background wasn't such a great move, but that's fine. Uh, we developed a way to shine light on antibodies and we look at the way they absorb that light and they change that light to tell us about the health of the antibody and it gives us a fingerprint and it gives us a kind of a nice spot. And if that spot moves from our measurement, we know that the antibody is kind of becoming probably tending towards aggregating unsafe toxin. Okay, so we can potentially now give you an instrument at the point of administration that can check to show your antibody is safe to administer. And we developed this kind of little portable instrument. Uh, it kind of goes in a suitcase, it's really cute. And we're gonna send that out to our great collaborators in Kenya and they're gonna test that for us uh, in a few weeks. So that's fine. If you kind of know how long it's going to take to get somewhere, you can check and make sure your drug is safe. But what about if you've got to go a long way? Some of these places are a 1,000 or more kilometers away from where you might ship your drug out. You just really can't guarantee that it's going to be any good over that period of time. And it just won't be. It will definitely be not admitted. You won't be able to give it. Well, with uh, Aisel Sabaeva in Bath, she's in chemistry, she's developed a way to wrap proteins in glass. And by wrapping those proteins in glass, those antibodies in glass, massively stabilize them and stop them from aggregating. It's a bit like she always likes to use this slide. I stole it. It's Han Solo uh, from Star Wars. And he was wrapped in carbonite. You doubtless will remember. And he was frozen in time. And when he was released from the carbonite, he was all tickety-boo again. That's the idea here. And it works really well. So we wrap our antibodies in glass. And then we check with our fingerprinting approach if it looks the same, if it's safe to administer. And they are. And these are real antibodies. And they've been left out for months in the heat. This works really really well. This is an early stage of something, but I hope it goes to show that we have to think creatively about solutions to solve problems, and we mustn't be greedy and gluttonous about the amazing technologies that we take for granted every day in our developed world. That's what I wanted to think about. How do we empower the use of this most impressive of technologies? I think we need to make sure and it's a regulatory level, and at a personal level, we have fair access of these technologies. We work out ways to put these technologies in people's hands. That's about miniaturization and portability and ruggedizing our approaches to getting technologies to people. It's about collaborating with governments and NGOs to try and find good routes forward. It's a really complex problem, but I think if we think creatively, we can solve it. Thank you very much.